Hi, this is Jeff Greenewalt, chair of the History Consortium. And our next program is about the folks in York County, Pennsylvania, after the Civil War and what their life was like. And our presenter tonight is Mr. Jim McClure. He is a retired editor of the York Daily Record and the York Sunday News and its associated digital products. He is the author and co-author of nine books on the history of York County. And he holds a master's degree in American studies from Penn State Harrisburg, where he did research on the history of journalism in York County, Pennsylvania. So let's listen to Jim. Thank you very much. This is great to, to be here. This is a very prestigious uh, group to talk to. And I just I get little tingles every time I get an inv invitation to, to talk to the group that goes back to at least the late 1990s, I believe. Uh, and uh, is responsible uh, in part for the Renaissance and Civil War um, in, in the Civil War in New York County. The interest in Civil War in New York County has taken place in the last 25 years. I, I, uh, the, the topic tonight is uh, after the Civil War successes and struggles um, of York County's people. And we're really gonna talk about the Victorian era or the Industrial Revolution, however you wanna talk about that. And I, I really, I know that I have a couple of audiences. I have some civil war, some really avid civil war people, and I'm going to uh, to to talk about the civil war uh, for sure. But there's also uh, audiences here that want to know more about this, that what happened after the civil war that wasn't necessarily civil war connected. So I'm going to try to thread the needle here. And as always, I really do. Uh, you know, relish questions as we go. So if you have a question, or I'm not clear on something, just uh, just uh, raise your hand or just blur it out and put it on the uh, chat in, online and uh, Adam will ask me the question as we go too. So uh, what we're gonna start here, uh, and you know, we're gonna do a couple things here tonight, a couple uh, goals. Uh, one is that the Civil War from 1865, uh, after the Civil War in about 1930 was, it was a disruptive moment, but shaped your county as we know today. We'll talk about that. Your county was really resilient and rebuilding from a terrible civil war. Uh, the emergence of uh, civil war vets and home front volunteers were among the community leaders that emerged after the war. And we really need to think of it as somewhat of a jagged upward arch, not arc, not necessarily a straight arc towards progress or towards a, a, a better community but one that was up and down, but at the end, it did peak right before the Great Depression. So we'll be talking about all that. And this won't be a talk about industrial giants. You know, we see some of those industrial giants up here and, you know, and that's a, that's a way a lot of people might talk about the, you know, the Industrial Revolution after the Civil War. And surely they were fueled by some of the things that happened during the Civil War, including some of the folks that came back from the Civil War and were, were really good employees. But we're going to go beyond that, as, as we'll see. Uh, you know, one of the things to, that we'll, we'll look at immediately is that, you know, sometimes we think about York County as a colonial town because the York Town Hotel and all the Duke Street and Queen Street and all that and York Revs. But really, York is a, a Victorian era town. Many of the things that we know about in York today, the row houses, many of these, these houses along the streets, uh, the main streets, and even our factories were built after the Civil War. We're really pretty much a, a industrial revolution town, and you know, but we 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 really do celebrate um, with the, our colonial era, and we should. And it was a great era, but I, I, there might be more houses than this. But when you look over here, these were the houses that are left that were around in the colonial era in New York. There might be a couple more. But these are the main ones, the Golden Cloud Tavern, Gates House, uh, Cookie's House, and, and Willis House. But most of our housing stock, most of our buildings came after the Civil War. And, uh, you know, we do have an anomaly here and there. We do have the York City Hall, which is that Williamsburg type of design that trying to bring back that colonial era. But, you know, really most of our stock, this, this is the uh, old, oops. This is the old colonial hotel here in the corner in the square. That's a Dempwolf building. Dempwolf was a major architect uh, during the Industrial Revolution, the Victorian era. And then this was done by another Dempwolf, uh, second generation Dempwolf. So, you know, these are houses, these are places that, that we're more used to seeing um, 
in uh, from, around here today that came up after the Civil War. A couple of things to point out here when we look at population, uh, and and this is this is county population here. When we look at 1870, we can see that uh, the the population trend went down in 1870. Anybody know why? Yeah, war, war, and the disruption of the war. I mean, that's a pretty that's a pretty big drop there from what we were seeing, and then it rebounded again. And then 1920, look what happened to our population. We know that before World War One and the Spanish flu. You know, if anybody ever finds a Spanish flu number for the county, I'd like to know if it's a mortality number. Uh, I, I haven't been able to find a, a good number, but you can see what it did to, to the population, the war in that together. Um, so we can see the war had an impact on our population. Then if we look at, you know, this, uh, the numbers for, this is for just for the city. Uh, uh, and we can see in 1870, the city actually went up uh, right after the Civil War. And, you know, anybody have a reason for that? Why would that be? The city went up, the county went up a little, went up some, but, you know, it, it was comparable, a little bit lower than many of the big years after the Civil War. Anybody have a reason? Well, why, do you think the, why do you think that we had such a large growth in this? In the, in the, it wasn't a city, it was a borough at that point. It wasn't a city until 1887. Because the migration of the yeah, yeah, there was well migration, the, the, the great migration of blacks and rural whites to the York County came 19 teens, something like that, came a little bit later. It was a different type of migration where people tended to go from the towns, you know, from the countryside into the towns. We'll see that in a second, including York. Plus, there was post-war uh, field up. I mean, soldiers got back and they had families and you know, they're four years older and so on. We'll talk about the great, great migration. In fact, we'll talk, uh, there's some pictures up here that kind of suggest that these figures here, well, especially Bonnie Grimes here, these came, you know, uh, Bonnie Grimes came here in the 1920s as part of the great migration that, that Jeff was talking about. And we had two schools built. This is a Smallwood school uh, right here. And, uh, and this is the Aquila Howard School. We have two uh, black segregated schools that were responsible to that. So that would have happened, they, that migration would have happened starting here, and it would have, you know, it, we probably would have had a population loss if, if we wouldn't have had that migration, the great migration from the South coming. And then you can see in 1930 and 40, uh, uh, you know, you can see that we got back on even during the Great Depression. So, uh, you know, about I think in terms of the Civil War, and this is one of the reasons why I think this, because many of our boroughs after the Civil War, all these boroughs, these were villages, but they came boroughs, they incorporated as, as boroughs after the Civil War, uh, and including this period that we're talking about. So everything in full happened after the Civil War. So you have people that were on farms in the, in the let's say the, the husband was away fighting in the war, and where would you go? You know, we have, uh, we have evidences that they would go and go into the nearest village. And you know that's where they would uh, they would stay. So it might have been that they stayed in there. They left the farms and went to go into the villages. And that's why we had these towns grew, uh, you know, including including New York. It, you didn't feel safe out in the country uh, with with the um, you know the guy away, and you're on a farm. So you go in and live with your family, your family members. And it, and it's possible that they stayed during that that time frame. In general, York was growing. So people had to live somewhere and they, they tended to go into the towns and the villages in this time frame. Does that surprise anybody? Does that make sense? Uh, you know, when you look at all those boroughs, we have 36 boroughs and most of them formed during the Civil War or after the Civil War, right after the Civil War, including, uh, you know, Jacobus, uh, example five over here, it was the newest one in 1929. York during this period came became a from a borough to a city in 1887. York was a borough in 1787 became a borough, and then became a city in, in 1887. So this we'll come back to this picture a little bit later. It has a, it's but this was the celebration at the time that York was becoming a city, right to, right after the Civil War, 1887. Now this is a I could I could show slides here all night and you all. Could too about all the things that happened during this period. I just chose this one representative slide that all four of these uh, schools uh, in, in York 
formed during this period we're talking about 1865 to 1930. You know, this is the original York School is still standing on South Duke Street. It's across from uh, Bonnie Grimes Gym, the Campus Park. And this one was down on uh, Philadelphia Street, uh, West Philadelphia Street down from Central Market. Uh, it burned down in about 1942. This this school was on the corner of, uh, I, I get these streets mixed up, a college in, uh, in George. And uh, this was Hannah Penn at, when it came down in, in the 1960s and would build this work high in 1899. And then we have the original, uh, we have uh, William Penn or York High built in 1927, all during this post-war period. So uh, again, this is try I'm trying to show what how important this period was right after the Civil War. Okay, now the, the impact of the Civil War, this was a, uh, it showed a great resiliency because I, I think we can often just the war is over with the guys came home, the women uh, left the nursing things that they were doing in the military hospital. You know, there's some degree of normalcy, right? Well, there was a heck of a price that, that the community was suffering. Now, I, I want to try to uh, bring that home. I tried to bring that home uh, by, by doing some math. And if you just take, these are Dennis Brandt's figures, if you take the number of, of casualties, captured, wounded, and dead, and you, and you apply them to today's population, it'd be equivalent today, 2.5% uh, of the population were casualties of the war, uh, dead, missing, and wounded. That'd be 11,000 people today. Does that give you a sense? 11,000, what happened if we had that type of casualty rate in your county today? You know, uh, and, uh, you know, 11,000, um, you, you know, uh, the, the number is, let's see, the number of servants is 6,000. And that would be equivalent, that would be 9% uh, of those, of the population, which would be about 45,000 people would have served. 45,000 people today, if, they, if there was a war today, 45,000 people serving. Uh, in, in, in a comparison point, and this isn't an easy one, but, uh, but the comparison point, this is the number of, of those that were killed in Middle East wars, about 30 people. So you take that versus uh, the, the uh, 11,000 who would have been casualties in the Civil War. See what I'm getting at there? It was a major, uh, a major thing for the community to deal with this carnage. Even if they came back, they were sick. And we'll see some examples of that in a second. I want to first go, I want to talk about the surrender. This isn't about the surrender, the surrender in York. But, you know, you know the, you know the story that um, the, the uh, Jim Barroli's division was knocking on our door. Uh, we sent a delegation out uh, to, to surrender the town out of near what's today East York Airport. Uh, they came to the town and extorted uh, you know, goods and, and all kinds of things and cash in the amount of $28,000. So we were dealing with that still. You know, there's people, there's still division in town over that. And here's one example that I, I can point to. The surrender was controversial then. You can say it's controversial today. Uh, but here, this is David Small, who's Chief Burgess at the time. This is his obituary in 1885. And it talks about in an obituary, it says it said they incurred the displeasure of a number of our people by visiting the invading forces of General Early, some distance west of York, in the interest of the weaker portion of the population whose fears had well not created a panic. So here we are in his obituaries defending his decision. You know, so it was, this is 1885, 20 years after the war was over with. And of course, we know, uh, we'll see A.B. Parker a little bit later on defending the decision. And even today, uh, you know, here, this is the debate that took place in, in 1988. You have Mark Snell saying, York Seal Law's decision cost the town's honor, catalyzed by future industrialist A.B. Barker. You know, so here, here we have Mark Snell's, uh, Juba Early was bluffing and they fell for it. He would not have set fire to that town. We have this guy from the Bar Association saying, York did what York does best. York treated the Civil War as a commercial enterprise and so on. We had that debate going on even today. And it's a good debate. We should be talking about it. In fact, we didn't talk about it for a while, for a long part of the 20th century. And as I always say, when you don't talk about the Civil War until the Civil War Roundtable got going, until Scott Mingus started his tsunami of books and so on, until that got, we weren't talking about the Civil War. And when you don't talk about the Civil War, what don't you talk about? 
You don't talk about race. You don't talk about our our our, our past successes or failures in the, on the racial front. You don't. You know, the Civil War kind of elevates that discussion. We didn't do that in the 20th century for the most part. And we that's another program in itself. But you know, uh, I'll show you some. Uh, but here you can see they're debating it in 1988, the 125th of, of the Battle of Gettysburg. Okay, so here's some of the other disruptions that are taking place after the war. Johnny comes marching home, right? But here's what, what here's what they faced. You know, we have we have all these, I don't know how anybody came up with this number of a thousand horses, but that's what I've used that number. I think Scott Mingus has used that number. But that's like a thousand tractors today. That would be a, a two mile long parade of horses. So I think that'd be a parade of horses from here to Red Lobster or something, you know, that long of a parade. Eight, I, I looked at horses eight feet in length, and you know, you do the math, and you know, that's a lot of horses and a lot of tractors, you know, right during harvest uh, season. We had 11,000 of these Confederate soldiers tramping our fields, stealing our stuff, you know, uh, and the families were disrupted. We had to have an orphanage as a result of that. We'll talk about that in a second. And then this is a number that I just think we ought to really, really. I always like to bring it up. In Hanover, there were more than 300 casualties, then missing and wounded, 300 in one day. Imagine if you're a youngster or anybody in town experiencing that type of thing right below your townhouse as you look down, right on your farmland. You know, and so that was that was a large battle, a cavalry battle right here in your town. Imagine that. It's just it's just hard, 300 people. 300 people, you know, that's, that's a big, that's a big number of people. Now, here's some of the other things that went on. This is June Lloyd. She wrote in her book, Faith and Family. I won't read all of this, but, uh, but this just shows change. And, you're, and it, it was a disruptor. I think in some ways it was a disruptor in York County, like, uh, like the York race riots were in the late sixties. Not all disruptors are bad. So you get disruptors can be good because they get you out of the status quo. And it, I think that's the point June is making here. For example, she says, Pennsylvania German men were uprooted from their familiar communities. Even those who escaped battle saw other places and met Americans different from themselves. And they were no longer Germans who get along speaking Dutch. They were Americans. And then, you know, the need for war materials that accelerated the growth of Northern industry. York young men left their small communities to work alongside others in the factories. Therefore, we have the growth in the boroughs, right? We have growth in the city. Um, uh, uh, York County Children's Book English learned in the public school established as a result of the 1834 Act. Only the old folks spoke Dutch. The young people were Americans. They dressed, spoke, and worked alike. A lot of change going on around here in 1865 in the years after that. Any thoughts on that? Comments? Did you ever think of about that way? Yeah, Adam. It's often standard interpretation uh, history of the World War II as well right. that you know war has this Americanizing effect, and you know there are all the World War II movies in general. They're uh, kind of caricatures, you know. They're almost cartoonish to an extent, but you always have these different stereotypes from different places in the country. There's a southern, white southern. Yeah. There's a guy from Brooklyn and there's a guy from Indiana, you know, and they all end up being this cohesive fighting unit. Right. And at the end of the war, then they're Americans. So I mean, it, it's not, you know, it's it's a it's a movie trope, but it also has this right basis of history. Yeah, and World War One was like that because we were heavily German, we were fighting the Germans, you know, uh, really fighting the Germans, and and uh, then after that we came home. We had the war in twenties, you know, it just kind of changed us and. And there was, if you were a German in the 19 teens in your county, you were suspicious, you were suspect, you know, because uh, because you would often have families over in Germany in World War I. So war has that disrupting effect. The disruption can be good in some ways. It can also be painful. And that's so it's a two-edged sword there. Uh, you know, this, it, we had a kind of a strange dualism here, not strange maybe, but uh, a dualism here in your county. Uh, we hated the war. Politically, we hated the war. We wrote against Abraham Lincoln both times, as you know. Uh, but it's present. Uh, but this was the Democratic paper. Now they were trying to make the war sound pretty bad. This is early in the war. I don't think it was quite this bad yet. But look what they're. I don't know. Maybe it's like 
I don't know, Fox and CNN today, you try to make it look as bad as you, one side or the other, as bad as you can. Its present results are in discord, confusion, the ruin of trade, the closing of workshops, the production of want, destitution, poverty, demoralization, humiliation, and shame, and so on. Yeah. 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 It, it, they're taking a political position. Obviously, the Democrats were in the majority in York County, so they're playing to the Democratic base. What they were doing. You know, we, we talk like that today, but that's what they were doing back then. Then, but we love the warriors, you know, in your county. And this was really, this is really important moment. We'll talk about this later too. The women of York also pitched in with enthusiasm, forming what may have been York's first women's organization. These women organized other women who turned in about the tasks and collecting or making stockings, shirts, bandages, and so on, according to Mark Snell. June and Lloyd will tell you, well, there were women's groups before that in the churches, for example. The churches had women's groups. But I think maybe Mark Snell is talking here about community-wide groups, so ecumenic groups uh, that were working on the war. So we love the warrior, but in the majority in your county, we didn't love the war. So that didn't go away right as soon as the war was over with. You know, we still had that uh, here. And this is an example of that. Uh, I won't go into all this detail, but we had a Democratic mayor. And then at that point, he was in the majority. This is David Small, also owned the newspaper, which is the predecessor of the Daily Record, I might add. Uh, and he, you can see his stats there. Uh, and he was, his position was the union as it was, the constitution as it is, and then Negroes where they are. That was the position of York County at the time. It's called a copperhead position. It basically was a peace Democrat position. We don't like this war. It's not worth going to war over with. Just leave slavery in place. Don't bother us with it. That was that would be the position of the majority position in your county at that time. And then we have this David Small, David Enter Small, another David Small. And uh, he ran, he made railroad cars, and he lived in the brownstone next to the Martin Library in Field. Uh, and he won he was very much a union man. If I can bring down a partridge with a gun, I certainly can shoot well enough to go to the defense of my country. And uh, so he he and David Small, David Edder Small ran against David Small in 1867. David Small won. David Small, the Democrat, won. So even after the war, we were still, or we were politically against the war. You know, we were, you know, even after all that, we were on the we were on the Democrat side still. We had a referendum in 1867, and we chose not to back the party of Abraham Lincoln. And they were not in the same family. They were cousins, maybe second cousins, same family, second cousins, not close cousins. I uh, I think they had, there were seven brothers uh, and they were from different brothers. Yeah. But the small family was pervasive in those days and some of them were Republicans yeah. and some of them were Democrats, we just saw, yeah. Uh, so, you know, this is just gives a, a kind of a sense of where we are uh, at the end of the war. This is A.B. Farker. In his autobiography, First Million the Harvest. We'll talk about him towards the end. But in 19, it was only 100 years ago that came out. Just keep that in mind. And he said basically, we'll get back to business after the war. It's a question of months, not of years. And I think he was right about that. Business started humming. And he said there was work for everyone. And so the, the soldiers came back. There's the last great review in Washington. The country began to hum with business. So that was what was happening a little bit at, like World War II, after World War II, um, you know, when, when, uh, when, when the soldiers came home. Uh, you know, we're going to go in here and talk about a GOAT. Everybody knows that Tom Brady is the greatest uh, football player, the greatest of all time, right? If, especially if you're a Patriot or Tampa Bay fan. Uh, you know, uh, the, who's the greatest philanthropist of all time in your county? Well, they, they, one of them emerged during uh, right after the Civil War in the period we're talking about. And, uh, you know, and this was Samuel and Isabel Small. Now we had P.A. Small and Samuel Small, P A and S Small. They were merchants, they were, uh, they owned mills and they also owned iron mines. And they were a small family we've been talking about. They are the main branch of the small family if you want to think about that way. And they founded four different entities. We'll talk about these one at a time really quickly. York Benevolent Society, Children's Home of York, York Legion Institute, and the York Hospital. So he had one, one guy and his wife who did all of that. 
you know, it basically got the ball rolling on all that. So it goes to show how things changed after the Civil War in North County. Imagine today, uh, you know, most of us would be hard pressed to say, this person started this business and it, it, it's it just imagine the scope of what they did, what they were able to do. This is a children's home in York. Uh, it was founded in 1865. And it was at Pine in uh, East Philadelphia. Now it's a shop at. Uh, and this, and the thing about this, this number, uh, this is 1875. Ten years after the war, the remainder of the school at present 57 children, 31 of them being soldiers, orphans. Ten, does that show you the devastation of the war? Ten years after the war, we still have 31 folks in our uh, children in our orphanage. And over here, you can't, you can't we don't have any time to read it. it talks about how. Some of them aged out, some of them went to here, or some of them went there. But this, those were those that were left. So a lot of people that were in that orphanage, a lot of kids that were in that orphanage after the war. Uh, in fact, I think that I, I would, if anybody was looking to write a master's thesis, I think the story, uh, you know, or you know, any, I uh, have a nephew or a son or daughter that are thinking about doing a master's thesis. There's a lot to be done about the children, the poor house in York County, the alms house this social history of these institutions, these institutions we're talking about here and others. Uh, York Benevolent Association is still with us and it was formed in 1863 for aid for widows and orphans and Civil War soldiers. We have uh, the York College, this is York Collegiate Institute. Uh, you all know where Campus Park is, you know, the Bonnie B. Grimes gym. That was, uh, the, that those were associated with this building here, which is York Collegiate Institute. There was an earlier building that burned down, and this was a dimple building that went up in its place. It's now a playground. They tore it down, it's now a playground. And this uh, this was your county academy over here. It's on Beaver Street, it's now a parking lot. It's Jim Steele's uh, there in the back of that parking lot. So Samuel Small made that happen. And then uh, we, you have your hospital. And what, this is really a good area for study because how many, we had a major military hospital here in New York County. How many, what was the connection between that military hospital and New York hospital? You know, I, there were definitely common surgeons, but it was 15 years in between there. So I don't know, there, I, don't, I haven't done enough to know what the link was, except there were common doctors. And so that would be a good area to probe, you know, how, how the military hospital inspired York Hospital. Samuel Small and his wife were, and they were definitely involved, Isabel Small were definitely involved in, um, in care for the, uh, those at the military hospital were interested in that. How did that spur the founding of York Hospital? That's, that's a really good area. Uh, after we know that in 1865, um, you know, the military hospital came down. This shows this mantling of the hospital, uh, of, the, of the military hospital. This shows the gazebo in the background that remains standing a little bit longer. And this article basically says, hey, the military hospital, they owe us a lot of money anyway for, for hosting them for all this time, but they did build us a park. There's improvements to the Penn Park, Penn Common, Penn Park. They made a park for us. Let's go ahead and improve it and so on. And they have sidewalks in place and things like that. They have trees that they planted. And so that was the impetus for improvements to Penn Park. The real improvements to Penn Park didn't happen until after Newark became a city. And that's when the, the, the soldiers, there's the, well, there's the, the gazebo, a little bit uh, better picture of, of the gazebo there. You know, the, this, the Penn Park really came up after, somewhat after uh, 1998, uh, 1898, after York became a city. And that, that's when Penn Park really was improved. And that's how Penn Park was when it, when it was at its heyday. Uh, that you can see the dimensions. This, this, I didn't know this up to this point, but the, uh, the, the, Female figure top there is ten feet high. I, I, I just never thought about that. That's it looks small. She looks smaller, but ten feet high. That that's a that's a big. So that's just a trivia fact there. That uh, but you know we so we have that monument and we have the Salem Square monument. And what I'm trying to say in this section is that we have really very little Civil War me uh, memory here. We have a couple statues, Salem Square. To, sorry, the head was cut off. I just couldn't find a better, a better picture. But this is still standing in Salem Square. But it's not really a, a Civil War statue per se. It's a, it's an American Revolution statue and a Civil War. It draws a line between the York Rifles of the American Revolution 
in the York Rifles of the Civil War. And uh, so it's, it's a joint statue, it's not a pure Civil War uh, place there, but it's still, a, it's a very lovely little pocket park there in, in the Salem Square area. Uh, yeah. 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 That area uh, is an interesting area. That's, uh, yeah. And uh, that area is, is coming back in, in, in many ways. There's a lot, a lot of work to do out there. At one time, it was kind of the, kind of the place to be. Salem Avenue is out there. And the, the Salem Avenue runs to York, New Salem. It's the old road to York, New Salem. And so, uh, and this is another statue, of course. This is a statue of Prospect Hill Cemetery. But think about this for a second. Out of those three, how many other Civil War memorials do we have around? We, around New York City. And think, and think about, um, you know, the, the Amer number, of, I, I didn't count them recently, but at one time there was 13 uh, markers or some type of uh, memory uh, fixture in Continental Square area to the American Revolution. Now, I think there may be a wayside marker to the Civil War in, in the Center Square area, the Continental Square area. I wonder why that would be. Why do you think that would be? We have three of these monuments kind of out in the suburbs of uh, New York City, and we have all this colonial stuff in the center part of New York City. Why would that be? Remember that they were anti-war. Right. Right. Yeah, and that surrender loomed. You know, uh, we had other things that we had a great American Revolution passed. We had a great World War II passed. You know, to spend our time on those, our Civil War passed in New York, not necessarily Hanover, but in, in New York was, um, you know, it, it wasn't something that we really were proud of. In fact, we didn't really emphasize it, for, uh, especially in the 20th century. Yeah. I mean, an excellent comparison is the square ones. You know, the, and I can't remember the, the official title, but in that elaborate monument, the sailor and soldier mm -hmm. right in the middle. Right. Um, you think of Chambersburg, it has a, a Civil War soldier right in its square. Bedford does as well. There's a Civil War monument in, in its square. Of course, Gettysburg. But, you know, our square is kind of vacant of the Civil War. It's like Civil War memory. So all those little things add up to say, doesn't mean the Civil War wasn't important. I just have spent the last uh, 20 minutes or whatever talking about the importance of the Civil War. But it was there was pain associated with the Civil War. Now, also, this was a time that the Goodridges, a very prominent uh, a black family, moved out of uh, York. They moved up for various reasons. They joined their sons up in, in Michigan, where they were, uh, where they had a photographic business. And Glenn Alvin was part of that photographic, started that photographic business when they were here in York. The Smithsonian's taken notice of that. And we'll see a lot more about the Glenn Alvin Goodridge name ar around uh, York County. Uh, but interestingly, during the same period, uh, Glenn Alvin's son moved back. His name was Glenn Goodridge. He moved back and he was a, a prominent, uh, I think he was a barber as well. He was a prominent person uh, in uh, Faith Presbyterian Church. So the Goodridges left and they came back. Other family members came back as well. And there, some of them, uh, at least three of them, are buried in Lebanon Cemetery, the historically black cemetery. Uh, you know, the, there's two GAR posts. Uh, we, we'll talk about the David E. Small post first. We, we already talked about David Small being, you know, this uh, this abolitionist, this friend of, uh, he was thought to be an Underground Railroad operator. He was a, a, a pro-union man. And so, uh, John, uh, so the uh, the Black, um, uh, um, uh, let's see, GAR post, sorry about that. I couldn't see that for a second. The Black GAR post named their post after him, which is extremely rare. Uh, to do that in America. I did, uh, Stephen H. Smith's done some really good work on that. And then Captain William Lanius did some work. Uh, he, he was he kind of started the Sedgwick Post, the White Post. And there's this image, I think, as Stephen Smith might have drawn, or maybe maybe Jeff did, I'm not sure. But on Memorial Days, they would have they had joint ceremonies. You know, they would come together on Memorial Day to honor the dead. And then they'd march up the North uh, George Street Hill. And one, the white uh, unit, the white GR post, would go to Prospect Hill Cemetery. And the, the black post 
uh, would go, the soldiers would go up to Lebanon Cemetery. They, had, they walked up the hill even further. So they kind of they kind of split off. Um, you know what the we'll talk about Lanius a little bit uh, later, uh, but he was probably one of the most prominent fighting men and became a successful businessman after the war. Long and short of Lanius was that he uh, he he has family on the one of the lumber yards in Wrightsville that burned uh, during the Confederate conflagration of of, of Wrightsville uh, or when the bridge burned and caught uh, Wrightsville on fire, and uh, then he. He ended up owning a lumber yard up in Williamsport and owned lumber, other lumber businesses. And so he built the avenues out, but he built the avenues out because the trolley line ran out there and he owned the trolley line. So, so he had one guy that owned lumber yards to build the houses. He built a, a houses, ran a trolley line out there to service the houses so they could work in the factories. I did look to see if, if he had a part of the wire cloth industry because the story is you had these horse-drawn uh, trolleys that created a lot of flies, you know, the horse uh, manure and so on. So you need screens. And so that's why New York Wire came into play and other wire cloth manufacturers. So that would have been a, a great, that would have been a hat trick if you had, if you had, had stock in the wire cloth too. But I couldn't find that. Maybe someone else uh, knows. Uh, uh, and, and this is uh, Lebanon Cemetery. Uh, you know, there's 300 veterans there. This is a cemetery where you know, the David and Small marchers went to, uh, and many of them are, are buried there today. Interestingly, Samantha Dorn says uh, that uh, there was segregation even in death. That's a historically black cemetery. We had historically white cemetery at the Prospect Hill Cemetery. But anyway, that went in after the Civil War, and there are a, a lot of Civil War veterans buried there. Uh, I'm still in the trolleys here because I just think this is this is so... This is so interesting, and this this shows the Newark wire, which went up because of the trolleys, the horse-drawn trolleys. But but also we had all kinds of other horsepower here, uh, the stables and all over the place. And uh, you know, and you can still uh, see those trolleys. Uh, York trolley is still running in over in Rock Hill Furnace in Huntington County. And you can go and see where the wire cloth was made in York Wire Works. It's been remodeled now. It's a uh, restored. It's quite a place. To, to go in there. So you see, it, I always like to put show and tell and go and do things in these presentations. You can go and actually experience a trolley that came up during this post-war period. And you can go and look at this, uh, go into a shop and see it's very primitive still, very nice, very primitive. You can still smell the, the grease and, and so forth. The very, it's very industrial like in there, but actually very nice in the New York Waterworks. So it's, it's a place to go. Now, I talked about Henry Lanius founding the avenues. Uh, he was, of course, with 87 Pennsylvania. He was a, he was a captain uh, in 87. And these are some of the things that started in the avenues. New York covering the paddings, the outdoor country club, the office of Edmund Rivera, Memorial Hospital started there, and Rudy Yard Glass, which is a major thing, glass uh, maker. So Henry, all, all I was trying to say here is that William Henry, they call him Ken, Ken Lanius, uh, you know, kind of created an environment there in the avenues that all this stuff incubated from in, after the war. So you can see a lot of momentum building here after the war, right? Uh, I'm going to really uh, move on quickly here. This is just some of the phys uh, physical disabilities that persisted after the war. And this is just one, uh, James Parton from uh, U.S. Colored Troops, uh, the war broke his health and he received $6 uh, a month, a, a pension check. He was put on. He was put on duty. His face and head did not seem right. Is what happened was the diagnosis of him during the war, and he he went through the war, came home, got six dollars a month pension, had to fight for it. And then we had this uh, Medal of uh, Winner uh, Honor winner Henry uh, John Henry Denning, who uh, June Lloyd says there at the end. It makes you wonder if he, if it's uh, post traumatic stress stress disorder. He kind of went. Um, he went and started a newspaper and was lobbying of folks, and they uh, took him to court. He ended up winning, but he was, he just was not what you would normally say it was right. Something was, he didn't come back in good shape. And that, that uh, continued that way, and he's buried in Prospect Hill Cemetery as well. So these things did uh, linger. This is, a, you know, we had a two-star general uh, here, William B. Franklin. He had a two-core at uh, Fredericksburg, uh, that was called a Grand Division. 
and he was a, a, a York native. And he went to, on, he didn't stay in New York, he's buried in New York at Prospect Hill Cemetery. He went on to become thief of Colt Firearms. He died in 1903. Uh, so he lived, not many generals, not many Civil War generals lived into the 20th century. He's one of the unusual, rare ones that did. And I, I always like just to show this because this is kind of ripped from the headlines. You know, uh, I, this is Chip Miller, who is a, a three star admiral. So our, our highest ranking officers in history was uh, Jacob Lauk Stavers, four stars, Chip Miller, three stars, and we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, William Franklin, two stars. So uh, I was at a, a place on Memorial Day at Gold Star Garden, and Chip Miller was there, and he was just kind of standing there. I mean, there's other people around him, and I, so I, I had a chance to talk to a three-star general. Uh, I, I've talked to one-star general before, uh, but a three-star general, especially when he's number two ranked in York County history. So I had a chance to go up and talk with him. He said, hey, you know, look at the credits of Top Gun, and you know, so I'm in there because I was head of the Pacific Fleet, or you know, in a big position at that time at the Three Star Town. So I, I went and I saw uh, Top Gun Maverick, Top Gun. And there he is, uh, uh, Vice Admiral DeWolf. Uh, I think it's H. Miller the Third. So your county, all roads lead to your county. I saw I throw that in. That's for free. You know, I thought you might enjoy it. But I, I did get tingles talking to the Three Star General, uh, Three Star Admiral. I was. Uh, then we have uh, Juba Early was the division commander. He, he was over the 11,000 troops, or uh, most of those troops that were here uh, when they invaded York in 1863. And he emerged uh, in 1883, 20 years after the war. And he said York raised only 72,000 of the 100,000 requisition levied, and York still owed him 28,000. But he got his math wrong. York only gave him 28,000, so he actually inflated what York gave him. So York probably should have paid him and walked away, but no, but uh, but York uh, but York Gazette got along too. York Gazette said uh, that they actually was forty eight thousand that they paid him. I think it's twenty eight six one zero that York paid, uh, you know, the Confederates to as part of the requisition. You know, General uh, John B. Gordon came here. John B. Gordon, who headed the major brigade uh, commander, came through here. Came through York, took down. The, the flag and center square went up to Wrightsville, and that was where the action took place in, in Wrightsville. And uh, he came back in, 19, in 1894, and he, he came back really somewhat as a hero's welcome. I'm just kind of wondering about that. What, what, what I wonder what you all would do if, if, uh, if an enemy general came, who especially caused all this, all the stuff we've been talking about, he was the main uh, culprit in all this, came back you know, 20, 25 years later, should we slap them on the back and say, oh, it's okay, you know, it's war, you know, we're brother against brother, that type of thing. Should we say, you cost me my livelihood, you cost me my father, you know, uh, I'm not going to go anywhere near you, you know, I don't, I don't appreciate you, I don't appreciate what you did, you know, what would you say to him? What would you all say? We, York, uh, welcome him back. Yeah. I don't understand it. No. Yeah. Then they say Southern York, to me, they Southern York County was sort of the first house. Yeah. Yeah. Most, uh, we voted um, more heavily against Lincoln in the Southwest than we did in the North, Northern tier of York County. So, yeah. You know, you know, should we have forgiveness? I mean, this test, this is a test, you know, it's, it's something to think through as you go home tonight. You know, and how does that translate to other areas? Should we hold grudges? You know, but the fact, what I, the way I factored in is that Gordon was was just not, a, he might seem gallant and so on. And, but here's here's Gordon in, uh, because he was, he presented himself as a gallant general when he was here. Uh, but here's Gordon in, in 1868. Uh, he was down South Carolina because the Democratic Party needed black voters to overcome the Republican vote in the Reconstruction year. So he needed he needed uh, blacks to back him, uh, back Democratic candidates uh, in that time frame. And he told this group that had uh, is a mixed race group. He said, "Because we had bought you and paid our money for you. Why were why did we not free you? Because we bought you and paid our money for you." And then he says over here that. Um, uh, but if you attempt to inaugurate a war of races, you will be exterminated. 
So Gordon, this is the same Gordon. We'll welcome back as a hero. Here's Gordon right after the war. And so I read stuff like this. I think, well, you know, I, I would that would be a terrible thing to have someone thinking like that back in our midst. You know, so yes. I think sometimes, you know, it's always about destroying um, the statues and different things. Well, you know, so long too in the South, where like I, I would think, well, I'm not crazy about either, but it's history. Right. And I would rather than take those statues and keep them, some of them, keep them safe and put them in a museum. Right. And safety because it is history. The kids should know about that. They shouldn't hide all this. Right. People and keep them like that. Um, and and yeah, maybe I wouldn't agree with that person with the statue or something, but yeah, we just don't destroy all history. And I would be extremely just livid if anyone touched Lincoln's stuff. So, right. You know, I mean, uh, you know, and they might say, well, I don't like him because they're in, they're in the South, you know, and they don't. So I don't think stuff should be destroyed. Even right. If they don't like and, and, and to your point, that's why we're talking about this tonight, because we're not going to not talk about this. We're going to talk about this is a major thing that happened during this period that we're talking about. So why would we ignore it? And so I think that's what we have to do. We have to talk about it. And, and that's what we're doing here tonight. You know, uh, uh, unfortunately, we have a ton of other things to talk about, too. But yeah, thank you for those comments. And I'm going to kind of just go over these in lightly round fashion. Uh, one of the things the railroads came in, of course, in a big way after um, in, in that period that we're talking about. And you can see this came from Tom Yingling. This is very interesting. This is 1895. You see, most of the railroads in York County were in the southwestern area because of the iron ore there, a lot of iron ore mines. Now, there was a Northern Central Railroad that, that, uh, that, that came up in the Mon Pa Railroad. It wasn't called that then. Mon Pa Railroad that came up as well. The Stewartstown Railroad is not on here for some, for some reason. But anyway, the railroads did come in, but many of the railroads were over here in the southwestern part. That was new to me. I never thought about that. Uh, today, we have, in, in your county, we have uh, three excursion railroads. Uh, two of them came up during the period we're talking about, the Northern Central Railroad came up earlier and of course was a major railroad during the Civil War. And then we have the Mon Pa Railroad that, that came in, and the Stewarttown Railroad that came in during this uh, Industrial Revolution. Um, yeah. uh, you know, the, you know, the road for women during this period, the Victorian era, was a difficult road. Uh, we, you know, but this is one woman that we ought to remember, you know, who came, she her husband died in 1865. And uh, so she was she as a as a widow, she would get all these things you can see up there. She was she was a postmaster, she built stuff, she gave land away. Many of the uh, prime things in York in Red Line today are on her former property. And she died a year before she could vote. You know, so that was a that was tough. And and those factories that were burgeoning in this time frame, they didn't they um they didn't didn't mean they would hire everybody. That was available. And this is a story from 1905. This is a courtesy of 11 Friends of Lebanon Cemetery. Um, and you can see there's there's a story here that the only at this point, the only uh, a black girl who was employed in a factory, there was only one black woman employed in a factory in 1905. So it wasn't necessarily equal opportunity for everybody during this time frame you know, that we're talking about by a long shot. Uh, but one of the things, you know, we talked about the Ladies' Aid Society that grew up during the Civil War, and they did the bandages and did the things of military hospitals. But in this time period, 19, 1904 to about 1940, all these organizations came in, the, the Women's Club of York, the Catholic Women's Club of York, the Garden Club, York, the Young Women's Club of York, uh, Junior League of York, Spring Grove Women's Club. So you can see during this period that the women's organizations, the associations, they kept coming together in a, in a meaningful way to do meaningful work. Uh, I'm going to skip over this. You all you know, well, I, I got to talk about this because we did this. Scott and I talked about this, but this is just beyond. This is right over in Columbia. You know, if you go to Columbia Crossing, and there's a little uh, dirt road that goes back into a meadow. And that's, and you see the abutments for this old bridge. This was a bridge that burned in 1863. 
you can still see the abutments there. And so you can walk on the same area where all this activity was taking place. It's now a quiet meadow. And, uh, but I always like this go and do stuff. I just urge you to go over there and take a look at this. This is really, you can actually, you can go and fish in that pier. That guy's fishing on one of these, one of these piers. And there's other piers that go across the river. So I just couldn't resist that. Uh, this is a, the, the flag pulling center in Center Square has a, uh, has an interesting history. You can see in this 1860s shot, which might be by Glen Allen Goodrich, because it looks like it's from his, uh, the Goodrich Emporium. There's no flag pool. And then early in the war, that flag went up. And Lewis Miller captured the surrender of York. Um, and so that flag pool, you know, played a role then. And then, you know, it came down in 1887. Well, maybe 1888, but in 1887, the market sheds around it came down. There's the market sheds. The flag pole was up here. They pulled them down the center of the, of the middle of the night because um, they had to clear the square because the trolleys had to come through there. And they had to move goods and people through that square. The flag pole remained up a little bit longer. And there's the flag pole during the celebration in 1887. I think that's August, September 1887. They used to hang streamers on it. See the streamers? They, they, they hung it during that big celebration. Well, they made a good use of it, and then the next year they took it down. They, the square then was empty, and it's been empty ever since. Uh, Hanover has interesting work, what Hanover has done, and they, they had market sheds in their square too, and they took them down in 1872. They replaced them with a fountain, and then that fountain was replaced with that equestrian, the picket, equestrian statue. And that was so that was in the center of the square for for many years. They moved that and now it's in the corner of the square. Again, in Hanover, their statement is the Civil War is important here. 300 people lost, you know, uh, lost their lives or dead, wounded, and missing. This is a big deal to us. And again, in York Square, we don't have that type of thing. So you can read the landscape and tell what a town thinks about itself and what it says about itself. Uh, this is a great moment, and you all probably know this, this story, but I'll, I'll go ahead and tell it quickly. This is P.A. P. Small's house. P.A. was a P.A.N.S. Small. Samuel Small was a philanthropist. P.A. Small was a businessman. I mean, they both were businessmen, but, but he, he lived here with his family. Uh, Samuel Small lived across the street. It's no longer standing. And then 1912, which is during our period, the Lafayette Club came in, 1912. And that was a, a, a men's only club, a white men's only club. And so they, they came in and about uh, the first uh, black man was admitted there or became a member in 1998. So relatively recently, but meanwhile, the club closed and became the York College Center for Community Engagement. And, this, this, the, and in that they had um, an art exhibit by Philip Chambliss. And she drew this picture here, she drew this art, art piece here of John Aquila Wilson. And this young lady here, Nakia Wilson, came in one day. I think it, she was there visiting, maybe a part of a class. So she came in there and saw her, I think it's three times great grandfather, you know, uh, hanging on the wall. She said, That's my grandfather. You know, so she couldn't have, she couldn't have been in this building. He couldn't be in that building. Uh, he lived until he was the last. Civil War veteran to die in the county in 1942. So he, he couldn't have gone in that building, you know, but there he is in the building and his, his uh, uh, great, great, great granddaughter, you know, was able to uh, see him in there. I think it's, it's a wonder, wonderful turn of events there. Um, we're going to talk about here real briefly about the manufacturers. We, we do have to talk about this. I know this is hard to see, but this is 1999. Stephen Smith helps us with this. <laughs> and you can see A.B. Parker, 510 employees, number one in, in uh, 1899. We have York Manufacturing Company second at the 507. Almost did it, just three, three shy of uh, A.B. Parker. And York Manufacturing Company is still around. Here's all the names of it, uh, and it's now Johnson Controls. So it grew up during this time period that, that we're talking about. And here's all these, all these industries that have you know, large number of employees. So it gives you an idea of the, of the breadth and growth of after the Civil War. Um, here's, here's a couple of things. I want to talk about A.B. Barker here. 
And this is uh, from his autobiography, The First One in the Hardest. And um, he talks about uh, that early in the Civil War, my own factory was turning out for twice as much as before the war. And that was more than less, more or less the conditions were all lines of manufacture. So this factory is humming during the Civil War. So in, not, in 1862, the Antietam campaign was in place. He thought the Confederates in the town thought the Confederates might come up to York in 1862, a year ahead of when they did. So anybody know what Parker did at that point? He wrote down to meet him. In 1862, he kind of did a prequel to what he would do in 1863. He wrote down and, and met with Fitz Lee, a uh, cavalry uh, commander down there. And he says, um, is it true, I asked Fitz Lee, that you're going to New York? I'm interested because I have some property there. No, he doesn't say, you know, I'm interested because she, I, we have a great town there and people and women and children live there and we don't really want you to come through here. You know, we have a, we're proud of what we've done here. I have some property here. And Fisley said, no, no, no. So we're not going to go through there. So we, we come up to the next year, you know, 1863. This is when the Confederates were out in Abbottstown, out in Farmer's area near today's York Airport. And we have this meeting um, and we have Parker writing that he, that first he said, uh, he argued that we could make a good deal. He's arguing to the Committee of Safety, which is a group of non-elected people who are trying to figure out what to do with the Confederates about you know 20 miles away or 10, coming towards York in late June, 1863. And Parker wrote that we could not make a deal. Uh, he argued that we could make a good deal, better bargain with them uh, then we could after they saw how little of our property we have been able to move. It's all about property with him, right? We talked about property the year before, and now he's arguing, look at all the property we couldn't move. You know, you could easily say it must be, a, you know, he's concerned about his own factory. He, was, he had a young factory there, there. And he said, my plan, however, was not seriously entertained. Then I told them I would take the responsibility of going anyhow, which I did. He rode out and kind of forced York's hand in the surrender. York, David Small, and others went with him out, and they cut the deal later that night. But he kind of forced them in, into the deal. And what was his motivation? You know, he was concerned about, you know, property. And, you know, so this is the mind of this guy, A.B. Parker. And I think this is important to understand this period we're talking about. Many of you have seen this. I've used this in many presentations, uh, this, this one off the left. And he... He goes uh, that York was distinctly northern, but not bitterly anti-Southern. The community felt that slavery was wrong in principle. At the same time, being acquainted with many slave owners, we also knew that slavery was better in practice than in theory, and that the planter who was cruel to his Negroes was a rare exception. Okay, so that he's taking that position. Then he makes this comparison. Uh, no matter what his personal disposition might be, slaves were so very expensive that it would be as ridiculous to maltreat them as to maltreat a stable of blood and horses. So he's comparing. Uh, slave enslaved people with horses, you know. So he's saying, okay, he had it. This is 100 years ago. He's an older man, and he, he just, he did, you know, he just made a mistake. So just to make sure that we understand what, where he's coming from, about uh, five paragraphs later, he, he's still on this topic. It often happens that the less you know <clears throat> about a subject, the more fanatical you can become. It's hard to hate a man who you know. And then he goes and says, if Uncle Tom, if the writer of Uncle Tom Cab and Harry Beecher Stowe had resided in the of the South, then she wouldn't have written the book or wouldn't have written that she did. And John Brown would have uh, known the people in Virginia. He would have known that they weren't going to revolt, that they were in the main, this is talk about enslaved people. Uh, th they were in the main more interested in three meals a day than in political theory. See what he's getting at? You know, the the, the people that are enslaved really aren't hurting much. He, he's completely missing the fact that that you're, that enslaved people are hurting a lot. They don't have their freedom. You know that's the biggest the biggest deal. Oh, I'm completely missing that. And he's said more interested in three meals a day than political theory. So this is uh, this is the mindset in York County in, during this period. This is 1922. He's writing this only 100 years ago. So here we have a, a contrast here. I'm down to the last two slides, Adam, so you can, we're, we're coming to an end here. And uh, uh, so we have two examples here. We have, 
we have Parker, we have Scott Minas talking about Parker. And, and Scott Minas says, alone with Al Ford to speak for the council, he rode off to Habitstown in the early afternoon. So he went off to cut a deal with the Confederates who were coming towards us. So he's riding west towards us, the Confederates. And here we have uh, in Wrightsville that John B. Gordon's troops, the guy we celebrated you know, uh, in 1894, here we have John B. Gordon's troops coming at the Wrightsville Bridge. And we have, we have a, a, a black man in the trenches defending the bridge. He was killed, as, as we know that story. But this story isn't as well known, and Scott tells this. Sitting on the bridge was one old Negro to whom was entrusted the duty of igniting the fuse, sat very coolly on the edge of the pier smoking a cigar. Obviously, he, was, he would like that fuse with a cigar. Right. So here you have this, this black man who was who had the whole the John B. Gordon's troops coming right at him, sitting coolly. He was waiting, he was ready to fight, you know, by trying to blow up the bridge. He, as it turns out, as we know, the bridge didn't blow up, they had to set it on fire. But he was trying to, he was going to light the fuse that tried to undermine the bridge, so only one span would drop in the water. Uh, so we have him sitting there bravely. We have A.B. Parker going the other direction trying to cut a deal. You know, how would we be under pressure? If we're faced with times like this, what types of decisions would we make? And that's one of the reasons why we, we study history is so we can learn from them and we can, we, can, we can try, we can get these experiences and maybe we'll make a different decision if we're, if we're faced with such things. And this is the last slide. And this is the goat. This is another goat. This, this is S. Morgan Smith. Okay, we're talking about heroes. We're talking about heroes, the black man on the pier, talking about Samuel and Isabel Small. Here we have another hero, S. Morgan Smith, and we'll end on this. S. Morgan Smith, uh, Stephen H. Smith drew this graphic over here. S. Morgan Smith was a Moravian pastor, and it was during the war. What did S. Morgan Smith do during the war? Anybody know? What's that? No, he was a pastor, he was a Moravian pastor. He became a chaplain for the Union Army, he joined the joined the military, became a chaplain. And then after the war, um, you know, he got into industry and he founded or was there at the beginning of York Manufacturing Company, which is today what Johnson Controls. So he helped found Johnson Controls. And then he helped uh, found S. Morgan Smith, uh, which became Alice Chalmers Boyd. Precision components, American Hydro, all these were kind of offshoots of, of the companies that he founded in precision calibration. So you have, there's a hero, he didn't have to serve, he did as a chaplain. Then he came and did all these, found all these big companies. And we had this image of Amy Parker who founded that one company that riding away. He confronted the challenge, joined the army, did this after the war, A.B. Parker, Wrote a way to surrender to, to protect his, his factories. I think that it's interesting. I would leave it to how would we do? What would we do if we are faced with similar types of decisions? You know, it may not be an enemy coming towards us, I mean, meaning a, a, a force, a military force, but maybe there's other things that are coming at us. How would we react? Would we, would we be on the right side? Uh, would we be, do what is brave and right? Or would we, or would we negotiate? You know, uh, try to seek some type of something to save uh, out of self interest. You know, how would we act, self interest or out of courage? So, thank you all. Any questions or comments? For all that, anything you want to, anybody want to debate anything there? What was facing the influence of A.B. Parker and God like that? How they even, even to today, their influence is being felt. No, I know. Some of the uh, stories that have just done about the refurbishing of the George Creek waterway and all. Amy Parker had a plan back then for right. improving the waterway and using that as an economic driver back in those days. Right. And he also wanted to help what he called the gutter kids, which is also back kids so in those days. Right. The interesting thing about Parker is, and I wouldn't wish this on anybody, but he, he let he those machines that he was trying to protect, the machine shops, his, his industry, uh, he died because of the machine. He was walking across Country Club Road and was hit by an automobile. 
and he was an invalid for the last couple of years of his life. And he ended up dying in about 1925. Sad, you know, but interesting, just interesting nonetheless that the very things that he fostered ended up killing him. I think uh, Barbara, uh, the factoring uh, conveyors for the postal service. Right. And then my, my mother worked in the, uh, the unemployment agency there on uh, South North George Street, on the right hand side of the road. Right. So on, uh, I guess they had the old building, but I see that's all going on. Yeah, and, and this isn't a rain on A.B. Park, or it might sound like that, but the A.B. Park, the, his company, he died in 1925, and his company lasted through World War II, and they were part, very much part of the work plan, very good, very skillful in making, and that might be what you were talking about there. They went out of business, they sold to Oliver in about 1953, and then those buildings became, uh, Oliver then abandoned the buildings, uh, and they were torn down. Uh, now there's office buildings along that part of uh, North George Street. So, so Farquhar's company did in some ways gain some degree of redemption in World War II. They made things, they were expert machinists, and they made things that, that really were very handy for the war. They won uh, E awards for excellence for the work that they did. Yeah. Questions, comments? This is based on questions from Bill Landis. Um, oh. And, uh, Hi, Bill. He's asking if you could talk a little bit about uh, maybe the year's time frame uh, of schools, school segregation in New York. Oh, uh, that yeah, that's a big topic, and probably ought to have Jeff uh, Jeff Kirkland who's here uh, talk about that. But but essentially, um, in in because of the Maryland because of the migration from the South, uh, there was a need for two, as we talked about, two segregated elementary schools in 1931. So they built the two segregated schools, but the junior high is more segregated. They, Bonnie Grimes would say, yeah, I went to both uh, Quilla Howard and Smallwood schools, but then when I got to Hannah Penn, I was there with other, uh, I was with uh, mixed race kids. And so, you know, it was mainly the segregation, at least in that part of history, was in, in the elementary school level. And then whenever Brown came in 1954, then, then it, it full, uh, integration took place. And those schools were later demolished. They were they were only in use for 30 years and, and as segregated schools from 1931 to 1954 or somewhere like that. So that's a that's a very uh, simple explanation. But Jeff, anything else to add? Yeah, that's all right. I, I was one of the first classes that attended uh, Prince, Street, Prince Street School. Right. When they desegregated that one in um, 1953, right before Brown was the Board of Education. Yeah, Jeff Kirkland was just saying that he went to a Princess Street School, uh, and that's when it was integrated in about 1953. So, yeah. Great. And yes? We're follow up that. Were the middle schools not, not segregated because either on the top of the elementary or middle school, or they just have a bigger facility that they work with? They, I don't know if it's a facility, but I, I still can never come up with my reason why it was yeah. set after this. Although only a couple of articles up over Reverend Monson, for instance, he was blaming against them having separate classes at Hannah Penn. So in the class at that time, when they first uh, were going there together, several the classes were separate classes. Right. I know that uh, I worked with uh, Bonnie Grimes on his autobiography, <clears throat> and he was, you know, you, you know, whenever he talked about going to <clears throat> going to the junior high, this was a moment for him because they would get hand me downs from the white elementary schools. One time there was a, a page 22 was ripped out of one of his books at the, at Smallwood school. And the teacher said, oh, just turned 11 twice. You know, so he got, so he, when he got to junior high, he was, and he talked about another, this is kind of a physical thing. Uh, he had to walk from the Noel school, which is on East Princess Street, about five or six blocks to Smallwood school, a youngster. And the small bit schools near York High, where York High is today. And he, used to, he said, it would cost, whenever he got to an intersection, he, his white friends would go over to Noel School, which is now Community Progress Council. They would go over there. He had to walk five or six blocks. By the time he got to the Hannah Penn School, middle school, there was like uh, heat ducts. And he would, he would huddle over those and thaw out. 
you know, and then he had to walk to a small one, which wasn't that far after that. But he, he, but to get to the middle school was an achievement. You could just see that he felt that way, and it, and it was. And uh, he he didn't talk a lot about the fact it was integrated. He just felt like the middle school, what, the education was so much better there than what he was getting at at uh, his his elementary school. Other questions? Yes. I just want to make a comment. Yes. Um, I, I look forward to your articles every Sunday in the New York City News in the viewpoint section. Yes. Newspaper. And you have um, quite often you've written about some more topics. Yes. And you, you wrote a very nice article on the battle to preserve the Muslim house, um, the land Susquehanna Discovery Center to roughly showcase properties rich in village history. And I could go on. I have here the article of York's Confederate surrender. Um, maybe parkour labor to justify his role in the exactly. Yeah, if you want to read all about it, maybe parkour, I wrote about him. You um, know. So, I really, you know, having been um, the program director for the Civil War Roundtable for the last 15 years and having worked with you and you and Scott Mingus and you've been pairing together with your books, I really actually am calling you what the New York County history detectives. Oh, you know, with thank your you. Books and um, I do, I really look forward to all of your articles. And you've written a lot about um, the underground railroad. So yeah. thank you for your interest. I appreciate it. Thank you. And we we have such a rich uh, others to draw from. Uh, um, Jeff Kirkland, you know, the things that Adam and Nicole do in, in the archives that we can go in there. I was just in there last week to, to do something on uh, on what's called the conspiracy of 1803. And I uh, wrote about that this week. Uh, so uh, we just are surrounded with such a uh, rich history community here. You can't you can't help but to uh, kind of be uplifted by it. So so thank you very much. Yes. Um, I was just thinking the other week when I had someone go off that Saturday day in school. And I'm so glad I didn't have this at the time that I was in school first grade would be in 56. And black children were in my school, East of Lancaster, a little tiny town. And so I didn't think anything about it. One of my best friends was a little black girl in second and third grade. And when I came to York, when I to York College, and that's why I came here. Well, I then with friends around, you know, York it was they were talking about this segregation and I'm like, what? I thought that was way back, you know, in eighteen um, not nineteen fifties or something right. to me. And all the prejudice, and I just couldn't believe it, you know. And it still bothers me today. And, but I'm so glad that I was really young when I learned to be able to just feel normal. I mean, it's no big deal. I'm a black person in school or next to you or any place. Um, because some of the ones my age are not much older and still have, you know, once in a while a word mark or something. You know? And uh, so. I don't know why we were allowed to have black kids in our school in the 50s, but yet you work in other cities around still have a problem. And, and really your your comments kind of support what I what I was saying that when you have a group of are talking about the Civil War as we're doing here tonight, as as Kathy and, and Linda and others have done since the late 1990s. You talk about things like you just talked about. You talk about race and so on. You talk about discovering uh, people that look different than you, and they really aren't. And you know, you have that type of discussion like you just were talking about. If you don't talk about the Civil War, you're not you're going to have a vacuum on that type of thing. And I think your county did for much of the 20th century because we just we just did what people weren't writing about it. They weren't uh, they weren't talking about it. They were. Whether they weren't Hanover, they weren't Wrightsville, they weren't in the Greater York area, and so uh, I think that that is really what I'm saying is we're here tonight talking about these really tough things that we talked about about Parker and so on, because we're talking about the Civil War, and then that type of stuff just comes out of it and shouldn't, because that's what really caused the Civil War. You know, uh, so so thank you for sharing that. That that's really really great. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Thanks. Thank you all very much. Yeah.